Good morning. Please rise as you are able. Come behold the works of the living God. Listen for what God would say to us. We await God's word for our church and for the times which we live. God beckons us to remember the support and prompting of the Spirit. We have received comfort, and our eyes have been opened to God's challenge. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. We open ourselves to God's healing and offer ourselves to further service. Amen. The opening hymn this morning is All Are Welcome, number 641. Uh, verses 1, 3, and 5, and since it looks like all the books you have, you don't have, the words will be on the screen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Now, trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves. We rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought word and deed, by your grace forgive us, through your love renew us, and in your spirit lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen.
Beloved God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please join me as we pray together the prayer of the day. Let us pray, O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, Atonement. A couple of announcements before we go to our children's chat. Today, our youth are doing a scavenger hunt. It starts at 4. It's not too late to come and be a part of it. And there is a special award for the best costumes. That's optional. But I hope there are pictures that we can see later on. Also, uh, just a note at the end of the service, the ushers will dismiss you. We've been very good about social distancing, but we want them to feel like they've got a job to do too. So allow the ushers to dismiss you at the end of the service today. And following that service, we are offering an outdoor coffee hour. Um, if you didn't bring coffee, it's just maybe more of a little fellowship hour where we're distanced outside. And that'll happen on the north end of our building. So if you're interested in sticking around for a short time of conversation and connection, uh, that's going to happen today. And next Sunday is a communion Sunday. So we will be uh, offering communion here. And if you're at home, you can prepare your elements or you could pick up your own communion from the church this coming week to prepare for that. Our guest pastor this morning is not a stranger. In fact, he and his wife have been members here for several years. But you don't usually get to see Charles because he's been leading worship at Hardin at uh, their Lutheran church for 11 years. He's also a police chaplain and has worked at the women's prison doing ministry there and uh, does interims and also pulpit supplies at other places. So we're very grateful that he's joining us this morning. And uh, we're thankful that you are also joining us this morning, whether you're here in this sanctuary or watching at home. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll pass the mic to Nikki for a children's chat. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if I'll ever get used to not having the kids, but... So kids at home, you guys can just answer, like I say, each week. Um... So, and you guys can answer too. Uh, so I have a question this morning. Have you ever made a really big mess? Like <laughs> the kind of mess when you look at it, you don't even know where to start on how to pick it up. I know I've made that. You can ask my mom. I know I've made those kinds of messes. I'm pretty sure when I cook, I still make those kinds of messes. And my kids have definitely and still do make those kinds of messes. When you can see the whole mess all together, it's really overwhelming. But when I was a kid, my mom, like all moms, seemed to know the tricks on how to make those hard tasks a little easier. And she just told me, pick one thing up at a time. So if your room is messy and you don't know where to start, maybe pick up your Legos first and then your books and then another, and another, and another, until pretty soon that big job wasn't so hard after all. So we, when we think about living like Jesus and following in his footsteps, that can seem really overwhelming. That seems really big. He was amazing. He helped so many people, and we can't perform miracles, right? And so that seems really overwhelming. But in our gospel story today, 
Jesus shares, he tells us that we can do small things. So the small things are important. And he gives the example of giving someone thirsty a drink of water. So we can do that, right? That doesn't seem so hard. If we think about just the small things in life that we can do to live better and to be more like Jesus, then that seems doable. So we can all lend a hand and help people. Maybe just the small things, they add up and they're very important. So my job for everybody here and at home this week, my, I'm asking you to go out this week and to look for things, look for the little things that help us live more like Jesus. Maybe it's holding the door for somebody or helping your parents carry in the groceries, making your bed, or telling someone how much you love them. So these little things are great, and they're very important, and they help us live more like Jesus each day. All right, so let's pray. Dear God, Dear God it can seem really hard, it can it seem seem really hard to live like Jesus. To live like Jesus. Help us go out each day. Help, Help us, us go out each day. day. And see the little ways, and and see the the little ways, ways that we can be more like Jesus each day. That we, we can, can be, be more, more like Jesus each day. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the church at Rome in the sixth chapter. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience? which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness and sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, to you O Lord. Lord. And Jesus said to the 12, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these 
will lose their reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you. O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you, Kristen, for that very sweet introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, gee whiz, it's been 12 years or more since I have had the pleasure of preaching to this congregation. And I am so delighted to be invited back here today to do this. One of the things that's always been so dear to me about atonement is their gift of hospitality. And you know, hospitality is one of the most ancient of human traditions. On the most basic level, you see, it's about providing the essentials of life for another person, especially another person who's on a journey. Food, water, and a roof over their head the essentials. But it's about more than that. The offering of hospitality brings two people, guest and host, closer. They make a connection. Now, of course, many of us make charitable contributions, especially to those that aid the needy. So as we sign the check, or more appropriately in this day and age, press the click the enter button to send a magic electrical disappearance of our funds in the form of another contribution. Okay, we've done our part. We've eased some of the world's woes, haven't we? But you know what? That's not the same as what Jesus recommends in Matthew 10. Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Now Jesus is advocating a true hands-on mission experience here. In other words, don't just send money, keeping the needy at arm's length, he's saying. Get in there and get your hands a little dirty speaking figuratively, of course, because whoever gives, not sins, even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, just a cup of water. Now, how ordinary is that? Ah, but a cup of cold water, and handed over personally, to the person who's thirsty. Now that is extraordinary. That little teaching of Jesus begins his directions to his disciples before they go on a holy walkabout. Preach the word, heal the sick, cast out demons, and generally try to convince everyone they meet that both the love and judgment of God just might be a lot closer than they think. Remember in the earlier verses of chapter 10, Jesus gives his dear friends some parting instructions. Preach, teach, and heal with boldness. If the people in one village want nothing to do with you, just keep on keeping on. Travel light. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Don't worry about what to say. Trust God to give you the right words and just in the nick of time. And when things get really bad, and trust me, they will, people may hate you. Even your own relatives may hate you. Just remember, they can kill the body, but not the soul. That's got to make them feel better, huh? And finally, those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Now, with these and similar words of wisdom, Jesus equips his disciples for their risky and momentous journey and christens them as ambassadors for the coming reign of God. That's it, right? 
You remember Peter Falk and his role on TV as Detective uh, Colombo? You remember his shtick was to fumble around in this rumpled old raincoat and his battered shoes looking like the most incompetent detective in history. Think Jacques Clouseau in The Pink Panther. And doing so, the murderer would relax, thinking, man, there's nothing I got to fear from this bumbling idiot. And then just as Colombo was about to leave the room, he'd turn around, take his cigar out of his mouth and say, just one more thing. Then he would drop the other shoe, the insignificant sounding afterthought that sprung the trap. And the logic you see behind the question was to catch the perpetrator unawares and they would stumble into an incriminating contradiction which would of course eventually seal their fate. Well cue the Colombo move now because at the end of Jesus' long list of parting instructions it's as though he turns to go away then he stops. But the one more thing, he says, is not a trap. It's a vital word of instruction. Don't shrink from offering a cup of cold water to these little ones. Okay, so who are these little ones? I think they're the very disciples he's sending out. His instruction here, you see, is not for the disciples, but for the crowd, for us. And it's not just for the locals, it's for the whole population of Judea. He's been telling the disciples what a tough world it is out there, and that they're going to be spurned and rejected in some villages, but that in others they will receive wonderful spirit-lifting hospitality. But they'll never know as they enter the next village exactly what's in store for them. They just got to go there and find out. Trust in God every step of the way. Then Jesus gives the larger population fair warning that he expects something of them as well. If you welcome me, you welcome God who sent me. If you welcome a prophet, you receive the prophet's reward. If you welcome a righteous person, you receive the same reward righteous people receive. And then he adds, Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Now you see there's a hierarchy being built in here. If this were the army we're talking about, Jesus would be saying, okay, whoever welcomes a general gets a general's pay, whoever welcomes a colonel gets the colonel's pay, Whoever welcomes the captain gets the captain's pay. And as for these buck privates I'm sending out, well, if you so much as even hand them a cup of coffee and a donut from the USO cart, you too are on my good guy list. And believe me, when it comes time for the final reckoning, I will remember that little kindness, just as I remember the grand gestures. Okay, now a cup of cold water seems like such a little thing, doesn't it? Well, remember, cold water was a rarity in Jesus' c culture. Nobody carried a Cabela's cooler around, and he didn't have to add that word. He could have just said, a cup of water. But no, he said, a cup of cold water. So what's the big deal here? Well, most of us can get cold water whenever we want it, can't we? At home, it's as easy as taking ice cubes from the refrigerator. And you probably don't even have to take them. You just push the button and they fall into your glass. And at work and school, we've got water fountains and water coolers everywhere. Sit down in a restaurant, if you find one open right now. Sit down in a restaurant and a glass of cold water will soon appear on your table. And sometimes you don't even have to ask for it. And usually you don't have to pay for it. But getting a cup of cold water in Jesus' day wasn't such a snap. Running water hadn't been invented yet. And for that matter, neither had refrigeration. A household's water supply came from the village well. It started out cool in the morning when someone, usually one of the women, walked down there with a clay jar, filled it, and came back with it, probably balanced on her head. 
She'd put the water jar in a shady space inside the house. But as the hours went by, it lost that cool, crisp, fresh-from-the-well taste. And by late in the afternoon, the time most thirsty dinner guests would show up, you were lucky if room temperature water was what you had left. At that time of day, a room in a first century Palestinian house with its thick walls that delayed temperature changes but could not stop them was just about at its hottest. If someone brings a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, Jesus' disciples, whom he's sending out to do God's extraordinary work in ordinary ways, it means she, the woman who brought the water, got up, ran back to the well, and came back with fresh, cool water. A special trip, a special effort for a special person. And that's what the best of hospitality is all about. Making that extra effort, going that extra mile to make it just right. It's the act of kindness you didn't have to do, but you did it anyway. Now, there's an ethic here of reciprocity. The disciples are going out to share the greatest gift in the world, the good news of salvation. And they will offer that gift for free. Now, some people will spurn them and throw it back in their faces. Others will accept it, but they'll let it drop as soon as they move on, kind of like those handbills you get handed on the city streets or at the mall. Dump them the first chance you get. And some will say, okay, here's a drink from the old clay water gel, if you still want it this time of day. But then every once in a while, someone will say, here, this is for you, a cup of cold water. I fetched it from the well myself. In our society, it seems sometimes that entitlement is going to be the death of us, doesn't it? Whether it's public employee benefits at the state capitol, corporate welfare, subsidies, Medicare benefits in Washington, or whether some failed nation feels entitled to be bailed out of its monetary crisis with our money. It's all about entitlement. Okay, Mr. Panhandler bum. If you're thirsty, I've got this half-empty bottle of water here. Now, I've been drinking, drinking from it all day, but, but it's still good. Now, it's a little warm because it's been sitting in the car all afternoon. And don't worry about those little crumbs floating on top. They're just from my sandwich at lunch, and when you tip the bottle, they'll go back to the top. Oh, and have a nice day. Are you starting to get it that cups of cold water aren't so common today as you might think. They may just be about as rare now as they were in Jesus' time. Elderly or disabled people, single parent families, those who've looked diligently for work but have been unable to find any. Are they entitled to a roof over their heads? What about the alcoholic? or the able-bodied person who's clinically depressed, or the working couple who could just about make it, but they're smokers. And the cost of tobacco now puts them on a downward spiral, financially and health-wise, because let's face it, I know from experience, they're going to buy their cigarettes before they pay their mortgage payment. I was in the business. These are messy situations. But poverty is always messy. And the politicians continue to try to boil these complexities down into sound bites to debate what, if anything, to do about such problems. But we know the answer. We know it because we're Christians. And the answer is a cup of cold water, not just any water, 
cold water, a gift nobody is entitled to because it's grace. It's nothing but grace. It's free. It always has been, and it always will be. We received without price, and now we give without pay. But aren't we all alike in our thirst? And the only person who can quench that thirst is the one who offers not just ordinary water, but cold living water forever. Amen. The hymn of the day is hymn number 720, We Are Called. Please rise as you are able for our song. now called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationship with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give us hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all inspired authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, 
and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned. We pray especially for Daryl, Eric, Bob, Matt, Felicia, and Fran. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God. Mercy. mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. This week, we pray also for Atonement members Rick, Roxanne, Ariel, Xander, and Sabra, Ray and Charlotte, Brandon, Heidi, Kinley, and Cater, Kathy, David. We lift up their prayers of need and thanksgiving, which are known to you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died, especially Lenora Weist. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God. Mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Please kind of share the peace with each other from a distance. You can do an air bump, an air hug, an air peace sign. <laughs> Nicely done. Please join me now as we profess our Christian, word, Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I kind of forgot to mention the offering because we don't pass the plate now because it might have germs on it. You will notice a basket near each exit door. Uh, if you haven't already and you are so inclined, you may leave your offering in the plate as you exit on each side. And now as Jesus sent out the first disciples, the church scatters us for service. We see, see the, the needs, needs and they scare us. Surely, surely others, others could, could be, be more, more helpful. helpful. Jesus chose ordinary people as apostles, tapping abilities they did not know they had. The 12 identified with people in their need who were sick, outcasts, or confused. 
Our, our listening may release healing possibilities, possibilities and, and our, our prayers open, open us to God's God. power within us. God goes with us as we leave this place. We, we are, are ready, ready to, to offer God's, God's peace, peace to our world. Amen. Now go in peace and remember that Christ is with you. We bring the hope we share in Christ to all. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As you leave, uh, you can join in with God be with you till we meet again, although we purposely do not share the words so that you may leave uh, and not be stalled by singing. Yeah, we...